to start by pushing record. Here we go. And maybe hiding the chat window. <laughs> um, but if anything happens, get my attention and maybe put, put it in the chat. In, in. And it just went and yeah. came. OK, well. It just keeps phrasing. This is like the worst I've had in ages. I have no idea. I thought it was all better and all fixed. And as long as I kept the motor. I might call Claudia and say that perhaps we should just get started. Yeah. Okay. Let's hope, let's hope it's still going to record and it's still going to work. Okay. Um, so I was going to begin by saying I was uh, nervous about the modem, but you know, that's pretty obvious now. Oh. I did get started. You can't hear me. <laughs> yes, do you want to do that? How do we do that? How do I? Can you still record if? Okay, okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Right, so my name is Max Edelson. I'm a history professor at the University of Virginia, and my area of specialization is early America and the history of cartography. So I was delighted to get this invitation from Claudia. Claudia and I go way back. We uh, overlap brief briefly as graduate students at Johns Hopkins. Uh, and to catch up even with the, uh, the, the vagaries of internet connections and uh, to see you all. So um, what I'd like to do today is to introduce you to my new research, uh, which uh, uh, relates to the colonization of uh, British America in the 17th century. Um, I'm, uh, and can everyone uh, hear me okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And you can see the screen I'm sharing as well. some images and show you some maps and get your feedback on, on what I'm working on right now. So um, I'm interested in the way uh, English colonizers understand the people and places of North America and the West Indies and how those ideas that they cull from books and maps and texts and assumptions get challenged by on the ground realities. Uh, this uh, presentation today is part of a larger book project that examines spatial knowledge and the creation of colonies in the 17th century. So I'm gonna be looking at South Carolina today, but I'm also interested in Penn. Which I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not tied to is called At the Edge of Empire, Founding Colonies and Making Maps in Restoration America. I, um, I've been floundering around with this topic, doing all sorts of research on it, not quite sure where it's going. And I realized that I, I'm really interested in two things ultimately. One is the schemes and ideas by which colonizers try to establish uh, colonies overseas and how map making and geographic knowledge is a part of that. So whatever comes of this is gonna be an amalgam of those two things. One of the things I've, I've noticed as a map historian is that um, map historians tend to dismiss um, old maps, the first maps that European colonizers draw of new world spaces, in part because they're so wildly inaccurate compared to the knowledge that comes along later. And I've always been attracted to the, the kind of cultural complexity of some of these early error-ridden maps. And I think the decision to kind of throw them out as, as sort of projections or fantasies, uh, you know, uh, gets rid of some potentially very valuable evidence of uh, the way colonization worked and how European ideas faced American realities. So uh, one of the maps I'm gonna show you today is one of these early maps. Um, and, and it is largely discredited as being not related to reality at all. But this is a map like the other ones I'm studying that can show how colonizers approached colonization and how native groups and other groups reacted to those depictions that were so wrong uh, uh, as they changed in that first generation. Uh, 
if you have these in associations with them. There are social forms common to Eastern North America in what's known as Mississippian society. Uh, they were uh, thriving, going social concerns uh, just before and just after European contact. These chiefdoms were regional powers that were built on intensive maize agriculture. They great um, chiefdoms, the so-called paramount chiefdoms, ruled over large areas and uh, exacted tribute from smaller chiefdoms. They used war and coercion, but they're also built on negotiation on, among people who shared the same kind of cosmology of the world and recognized the spiritual and political hierarchies that govern chiefdom society. Um, so I think chiefdoms are uh, an important and neglected idea in um, reality and in European thought, especially uh, when it comes to the colonization of South Carolina, which is the one restoration colony that is founded in an area that was a place dominated by chiefdoms in the era before European contact. So chiefdoms were this spatial concept that shaped how Carolina's English founders saw the place they called Carolina. And the basic argument Carolina believed that powerful, prosperous chiefdoms dominated the southeastern interior of North America. The group in charge of founding Carolina was called the Lords Proprietors of Carolina. They came to this understanding of uh, the chiefdoms they were going to encounter because they studied the early maps and texts that had been generated by the Spanish in the 16th century. Part two, the English saw these chiefdoms as a real asset and they wanted to reach out and make contact with them because the Spanish had become entrenched in uh, Florida at St. Augustine, and they wanted to make alliances with some powerful chiefdoms as allies against the Spanish in Florida and maybe as potential conquests in the future. The idea of planting a colony like Carolina for the English was always about plantation agriculture and commerce, but the idea that one English colony at least could uh, have a part of the riches and wealth that Spain got by uh, taking over indigenous uh, cities and communities was tantalizing to them. So they held out that possibility. The presence of chiefdoms on old maps made that reality seem like something that would happen. Uh, part three, the English fixated on one particular chiefdom that, had, that the Spanish had written about. It's a place called Cofita Chequi. Um, this is a key chiefdom that figured very largely in the written accounts of De Soto's Entrada into the North American interior in the late 1530s, early 1540s. Um, and uh, finally, um, during the first generation of settlement in South Carolina, English Carolinians discovered that the idea of chiefdoms that they had inherited from Spanish knowledge didn't in fact describe the native world they actually encountered. The real world that was South Carolina in the 1670s, 80s, and 90s was not really a place of long settled chiefdoms anymore, although there were influences and remnants from this earlier society. These had largely collapsed by the early 17th century. The Southeast, by the time the English got there, was a place dominated by mobile groups who were known as coalescent societies, which had gathered up refugees. Um, Many of these coalescent societies became trading partners with the English. They became uh, Indian slavers and deerskin hunters. In the 1680s, um, although they made brief contact with people they thought represented this fabled chiefdom of Confita uh, Chequi, um, lost contact with this chiefdom and it disappeared from all records. It lingered on briefly in maps, but this idea of a chiefdom that South Carolina was gonna rely on to leverage its power in the region was gone. Uh, the idea of this chiefdom turned out to be an illusion. After Kofita Cheki disappeared from English records, English colonizers had to adjust to the realities of native life that they didn't expect based on their learning and knowledge. So this is largely a story of false assumptions, of out-of-date knowledge, of fantastical maps, that shifted and changed with new conceptions and information. It's also the story of how the English came to terms with Native America and how Native Americans came to terms with English Carolina.
So where does John Locke fit into to all of this discussion? So it turns out uh, one of the leading colonial administrators in early South Carolina was none other than John Locke, the same John Locke that all of us had to study at some point in our educations. He's one of the Enlightenment's key philosophers. He uh, lays the foundation for the English empiricist tradition. Um, his famous essay concerning human understanding is, is can still considered a classic in the field. He wrote influential tracts on money and trade and religious toleration. But uh, John Locke is probably best known for one of his political writings, The Second Treatise of Government. This was a text that, I mean, was a watershed in the evolution of Enlightenment political thought. It is the foundational text in the conceptualization of individual liberties and natural rights in the Anglo-American political tradition. It also makes a significant contribution to the development of early modern political economy. For my purposes today, Locke is important but it's because he created the key philosophical justification for native dispossession in English America and elsewhere in the world. Locke uh, rose to prominence in England when uh, Lord Um, he was the most prominent of a circle of radical Whigs who had helped Charles II uh, uh, gain his throne uh, during the Restoration. Ashley also worked very hard to exclude uh, Charles II's brother, the Duke of York, from uh, succeeding him. Um, and all of you probably know a lot more than I do about the, the politics and religious history of 17th century England, but John Locke and Lord Ashley are right in the, in the middle of it. Uh, so Whigs like Ashley and Locke saw the opportunity to found new colonies in America as a chance to improve society. Uh, their plan for Carolina included a lot of ambitious social reform based on humanistic learning uh, and principles. They wanted to make a study of colonization in part because, and this is why I think Restoration era colonies are so interesting, uh, English colonizers had the example particularly of New England, Barbados, and Virginia, which had already been settled and had committed so many errors in how to found a colony, especially in the case of Virginia and New England, uh, it, uh, with uh, violent uh, wars against Native Americans, that, that Ashley, Locke, and other restoration colonizers really wanted to look at the histories of these uh, volatile colonies and try to do better, try to create a better model for implanting new colonies in the new world. Uh, Ashley made John Locke uh, really the key administrator. Some people call him the secretary of the Carolina colony. Uh, the Carolina colony was chartered by Charles II in, originally in 1663, and the, the colony was permanently settled from 1670, close to the site of modern day Charleston, South Carolina. By the late 1680s, when Locke wrote the second treatise, uh, Lord Ashley was dead. Locke was no longer directly involved in South Carolina, although he was he became a member of the Board of Trade, so he was still involved in colonization. But his experiences in Carolina, and that's my argument here today, deeply influenced his thinking about uh, the state of nature, uh, the labor theory of property, and Native American society that were so important to the Second Treatise of Government. And I have a handy picture of John Locke to show you while I talk about him a little bit. So um, by examining how Locke gathered knowledge about Native America, I think we can come to new understandings of this key Enlightenment document and these, especially these, these notions of the state of nature and the labor theory of property. So what if we reread re the second treatise in light of Locke's experiences at the helm of the Carolina colony as it began? What lessons did he learn about Native America in the state of nature in his interactions with um, the correspondence that was coming from Carolina about events in, in the colony uh, and all of the reading he did in um, contemporary literature to understand the place that the Carolina colony was founded? My research uh, examines how Locke engaged with a rich corpus of information about the peoples and places of the Southeastern interior. Locke was always the empiricist. He studied uh, everything he could get his hands on from 16th century Spanish accounts and maps that located and described this world that he believed was populated by powerful indigenous chieftains. 
He reviewed and summarized all the correspondence that came from people in Carolina and presented it to the Lord's proprietors. He was the key person, the, the, the key figure uh, managing information for the Carolina colony for much of the 17th century. He also sketched new maps and wrote new tracts that described South Carolina. So we have a, a documentary and graphic record of his ideas of the kind of place it was. Um, and uh, Locke's view of America, I think, drew from his ethnographic research into native society in the Southeast. As he described the state of nature and the relationship between property and improvement in the second treatise, he drew on this very specific knowledge relating to Native America, uh, Native Americans in Carolina as a place of declining civil order, increasing violence and dispersed settlement. So my approach is to view Locke's characterizations about America in the second treatise um, in relation to the American place that he knew really better than any other. My re research not only draws on the, this corpus of contemporary information and maps, but also modern work by archeologists, anthropologists, and ethno-historians trying to compare Locke's conclusions with the realities of indigenous life in the Southeast. Um, one of the things I was surprised about, but I find uh, useful for this project is um, although, you know, Locke is someone who more than anyone else provided a philosophical rationale for Indian dispossession, he was also a humanist in the broadest sense. He was ethnographically curious. He wanted to know as much as he could about non-European people around the globe. Uh, and he did so with a degree of uh, sympathy that you would expect of a learned uh, humanist. Um, and he based all this research to reach what I think everyone agrees now was a flawed conclusion about the nature of native society um, in the second treatise. The key idea at the heart of the second treatise is the notion of the state of nature. So in the treatise, Locke, Locke writes, in the beginning, all the world was America. And what he meant by this was that native North Americans should be regarded as kind of like living remnants of what early human existence was like before the rise of civil society. According to Locke, these early human people lived largely off the land through hunting. They belonged uh, to societies that didn't have any meaningful uh, government, any meaningful executive authority, and did not have the capacity to enforce law and order. Such a life was predicated in Locke's view on spatial abundance. Humankind was uh, in the pre uh, government era spread thinly across the surface of a vast globe. In Locke's time, America remained a living reminder of this ancient reality of the way all humankind used to be. Individuals gained subsistence. Garden of Eden, they were always precarious. Without states, any other person could take what you had. Um, and you had no recourse except to take their lives, to enter into what Locke calls the state of war. So life before the social contract, uh, life before the formation of government was a life that was full of freedom and independence, but also um, deeply violent and precarious. It was only when people empowered government to protect individual lives and individual property could this volatile and unstable state of being be left behind by civilized government and society. By Locke's labor theory of property, people mixed their labor with the land and that gave them, gave them the right to fence it off and declare it their own. Uh, they had the state there as they joined in governments to defend it with a judicial system, with a system of law and order. And they developed money so that the perishable goods they could extract from nature could persist and be the basis of a system of expanding commerce. Um, to Locke, so what he called the wild Indian uh, lived a very different life. Uh, this figure in the second treatise took deer in the forest, or hunting deer is the, 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 the metaphor Locke returns to again and again. Uh, these deer roamed free in nature. They were anyone's property until the moment that the Indian hunter fired an arrow that hit its mark. That earned the hunter the right to its prey. For Locke, the forest and the uncaptured deer running around in it remain the common property of all mankind until people mixed their labor with it, then taking it out of the state, state of nature and making it their own. So among other conclusions, uh, 
early Americans and British colonizers embraced Locke's ideas because they provided such a sound philosophical pretext for uh, native dispossession. Uh, really until the 1760s and even then only haltingly and incompletely, Britain did not acknowledge native hunting grounds as legitimate property that belonged to native states. Such lands were always regarded as a wilderness and they could be occupied and claimed by Europeans without um, uh, any kind of compensation. They used Locke explicitly to justify such ideas. So I'm not the first scholar who's tried to draw these firm connections between South Carolina where Locke was involved as a colonizer and uh, Locke's work as a political theorist, James Tully, Vicki Sue, William Batts, Barbara Arneal, there's many others uh, who have studied Locke and Native Americans. And in general, and I'm generalizing here quite a bit, uh, these scholars have assumed that Locke's assumptions about Native life were really just shallow stereotypes, that he was creating a straw man figure of the wild Indian in order to justify what he wanted to justify in the second treatise. We know that Native Americans had government, law and order, money. They spent considerable labor transforming forests into productive deer habitats. So everything that Locke said about Native Americans is in large measure wrong. We can really see how Native American societies were not stateless societies. They were societies with culture, society, and government. Locke, most of these scholars argue, was simply ignorant of Native life and culture, and sort of intentionally so. While Locke claimed that Native Americans did not use the land intensively, uh, I think one of the, the most interesting arguments along these lines is James Tully's arguments. He counters that um, really because Native Americans were practicing a sustainable form of subsistence-based agriculture, they, they did actually you know, uh, fulfill the carrying capacity of the land, one of Locke's key arguments about why European uh, civilization was better than Native civilization when it, when it came to claiming the land. So uh, I'm engaging with this scholarship. I'm still learning more about Locke and all the very rich scholarship that relates to it. But I have a really different take on this problem of Locke, Carolina, and Native America. I don't think Locke was ignorant of Native American society, especially in Carolina, where, I mean, I've read the same documents that he read. I've read all the memoranda he wrote summarizing all the documents. He knew a lot about Native life in Carolina. Um, so it's not, um, it's not ignorance that accounts for Locke's mistakes or his perspective. Um, he also made an exhaustive study of, of all of the literature he could find about the Southeast in general before the English came there. He was in many ways a diligent ethnographer of Native America who did his research. His errors, his, uh, his, his false characterizations of Native life and society reflected the quality of his knowledge that he synthesized and not, I think, an intent, an intent to distort what he knew. Um, so my purpose here today is not to defend Locke, but to understand the information he had at his disposal um, about Native Southeasterners and what he did with this knowledge. I argue that Locke forged a vision of Native America in response to a profound sense of English disillusionment in this region. English colonizers came to Carolina with a strong expectation of meeting these powerful civilized Indian chiefdoms who would be their allies, maybe their adversaries, maybe even their future conquests. When Locke and others discovered that such chiefdoms had been replaced by these new coalescent societies, and we'll talk more about them in a moment, um, these are societies that lacked political organization, according to the English, they, they were poor, they uh, were uh, nomadic, according to the English. Uh, he drew a new kind of dispirited portrait of native life based on this disillusionment at um, having to adjust to these new uh, circumstances. And that I argue is the real source of his characterizations about the state of nature in the second treatise. So given the broad impact of John Locke's ideas about America based on these um, based on this experience, I, I think it's, it's an important new direction to take Locke's scholarship and I hope the history of colonization. It shows how the volatility of what some scholars have called the Southeastern shatter zone influenced a more general picture of uh, native life on the frontiers of British America. So I'd like to turn next to some of the maps and texts that John Locke used to make sense of this place in the 17th century. 
Locke, like many Enlightenment thinkers, was curious about the world and its diverse peoples and cultures. His library was stocked with narratives of European travel, especially accounts and discoveries of the New World. Uh, I think the best thing I've read recently is by Mariana de Campos Franzosa. Uh, she's written a really interesting kind of watercolor drawings that when, when John Locke had to flee England um, uh, uh, in the 1680s, he took refuge in the Netherlands and he commissioned the creation of 26 watercolor drawings that were drawn from Dutch sources of people all over the world. And the image you're seeing in front of you, this prince from the island of Gilolo in the East Indies is, is one of these 26 that are currently in the British library. Um, so this, these images, I mean, this is just an example, but um, there are lots of ways to dehumanize Native Americans in text and image uh, by Europeans. Sarika Davies has just written a wonderful uh, book about um, how uh, maps depicted uh, inhabitants of the Caribbean and Brazil as, as kind of savage cannibals, how that trope uh, came into view. This is not that trope, right? This is a, a very humanizing picture of non-European people, even if it did come with a supposed cultural hierarchy that put them maybe as uh, more primitive and Europeans as more advanced. Locke, you can tell, is like other humanists, um, sympathetic uh, and wants to understand these cultures on their own terms, even if he is also working in service of um, colonizers. Um, Locke also recorded uh, one of his memorandum for uh, memoranda for Carolina is uh, found in Lord Ashley's colonial papers. He has a little memoranda that, that says writers of Carolina. And he just lists essentially his bibliography, all of the key sources that he read and that others should read if they wanna get a handle on the place that English colonizers are about to enter in the Southeast. So among these writers of Carolina who he thought were the most important, he singled out the chroniclers of uh, a Spanish uh, uh, explorations and voyages in the 16th century. People like Herrera, Oviedo and Acosta were his indispensable guides to Spanish knowledge of the new world. So uh, I've read these not in Spanish, but in translation and Locke may have read them in translation as well. A lot of these Spanish chronicler, chronicles um, were uh, translated almost within a decade into English uh, into, and some of them were written in Latin, which John Locke did, did read. So, so what did John Locke learn about the native Southeast by reading these accounts of Spanish journeys, especially the ones that ventured into the place that would become Carolina, into the southeastern part of North America. He learned a lot about Hernando de Soto and the particular Spanish entrada into the interior of what would become South Carolina, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, and other places in the Southeast. And he learned in particular about this chiefdom called Cofita Chequi that was located somewhere in the interior of Carolina. There are, this is something I didn't fully appreciate before, but there's a whole shelf of books at the library uh, devoted to what, what is sometimes called DeSoto studies. And this is largely the work of anthropologists who have uh, spent a lot of time and energy trying to locate based on these narrative sources, the actual path that DeSoto and his men took in the late uh, 1530s, early 1540s through the Southeast. And Charles Hudson's reconstruction of this from the 1990s is considered the best. And of course, archeologists wanted to reconstruct this so they could find good places to dig. And they've in fact turned up what they think are uh, the, uh, the uh, archeological site uh, where a lot of these chiefdoms were. Um, but what we do know from uh, these narratives that Locke read uh, that the Spanish wrote about the DeSoto expedition is that as soon as Hernando de Soto arrived on the coast of the Gulf Coast of Florida in 1539, he was looking for a way to make a new conquest in the interior. And like many Europeans did, he captured two native people and he interviewed them. I guess that would probably be a polite way of saying, uh, uh, extorted whatever information he could from them uh, to try to figure out where he was going in this uh, place he did not know at all. And uh, these two captives um, did have a place in mind that seemed to answer everything that DeSoto wanted. They called it Kofa Chiqui. And if any of you done any, have done any text mining work with old terms, I have found, I keep a list of them, two dozen different varieties of this word, uh, Kofita Chequi. And I think that makes it harder for me, but it, it makes it also interesting because what you have is um, a place name that exists in the world at this time, but has been transliterated and translated and 
turned from or something that some some Spanish ear heard um, from from some native informant, and then eventually finds its way to Latin text on some map or some narrative. And so there's a million different ways to spell Cofita Chequi, but this is what archaeologists have settled on as as the name of this place. And on this map of uh, De Soto's Entrada, you can see I've highlighted Cofita Chequi as one of uh, many different places that De Soto visited during the Entrada. Um, Cofita Chequi, according to archaeologists, is the easternmost outpost of North America's Mississippian culture, um, featuring tributary rule, mound building, and all the other material and cultural trappings about what some archaeologists still call the southeastern ceremonial complex. So this is a society that's very different from the rest of the eastern woodlands, uh, Native Americans that, like the Algonquins, that New Englanders and Virginians, well, the Virginians do encounter a chieftain, but New Englanders are encountering a very different kind of native culture. Um, so uh, this is, uh, Cofita Chequi is, the, is the, the place closest to Carolina, and it's the easternmost outpost of this Mississippian chiefdom culture. So by reading these authors who describe De Soto's experiences in, in Cofita Chequi, as really the central drama of the beginning of this entrada, Locke gained a picture of the native world he thought that awaited the English in Carolina. These chroniclers described how Soto's men nearly died of starvation as they struggled to find Cofita Chequi. They spent weeks in an uninhabited wilderness. They, this fact alone demonstrated something about chiefdom life, how these, these independent, powerful chiefdoms were kind of spread out across the landscape and were perpetually at war with each other. When the Spanish approached the heart of the chiefdom, they saw its uh, Miko, or paramount ruler, who they called the Lady of Cofita Chequi. And I haven't been able to find an attribution for this, but I think this is a 17th century Dutch engraving of this story. Uh, the Lady of Cofita Chequi was born on an elaborate litter. She was ferried across a river to meet Soto um, uh, in a fine canoe. Um, and this is exactly the kind of display that De Soto was looking for because someone so powerful and so, so rich would definitely have some wealth that, that could be plundered, definitely ruled a society that could be conscripted to serve the bidding of Soto and the Spaniards. Um, one of the first things that the Lady of Cofita Chequi did is place a string of pearls around Soto's neck. He liked that quite a bit. It was an act of diplomacy, of course, but it, it reinforced what the Spanish were looking for uh, everywhere they went, which was sources of mineral wealth that could uh, compare to the silver of Peru or the gold of the Valley of Mexico. Spanish soldiers consumed the chieftain's food as they stayed at Cofita Chequi. Um, after uh, you know, wandering in the wilderness and their voraciousness made it clear how chiefdom society worked. Uh, it depended on uh, extracting surpluses of maize from surrounding communities and creating this storehouse of wealth that the Spaniards plundered. Um, the big news about Cofita Cheque and the accounts is that this is a place where uh, Soto's men found a, a big, beautiful mortuary temple. Um, with stockpiles of pearls that uh, they took by the uh, bushel. Uh, the chroniclers that Locke read describe a uh, second encounter with Cofita Cheque after De Soto left. Uh, De Soto uh, went on to his entrada. He died in America in the 1540s. Uh, but by the 1560s, the Spaniards were back and they reestablished briefly contact with Cofita Cheque. After the Spaniards uh, uh, set, their, uh, set up St. Augustine in Florida, um, a, uh, uh, an officer named Juan Pardo was sent with 250 soldiers to reconnect with all the places that De Soto had visited and establish little compounds, um, little houses within their communities uh, where their soldiers could be stationed and fed. These outposts lasted about a year and a half until the native residents rose up against them and drove them out and killed most of them. After that, Spain completely loses contact with the chiefdom of Cofita Chequi. Um, they are aware of its existence, but they never have direct contact with it again. They, the Spanish turn to towns closer to the Florida coast in Temucua and Apalachee and create their famous uh, Franciscan mission uh, uh, communities among the Christianized Indians of the Gulf Coast of Florida. Contemporary maps underscored this image that came from the uh, narratives. 
Um, one of the things I've been studying, and I won't bore you with the details, I've written about it somewhere else, is um, I've always been intrigued by the fact that Spanish maps of the New World have little icons for cities that almost look like European cities that stand for indigenous communities in the Americas. Um, the very first map that was published in 1524 of Tenochtitlan, Mexico City, uh, was, was, a, was a beautiful urban plan of, um, of Mexico City that uh, became a kind of template for how Europeans understood indigenous society in the Hispanized world. And this is another map uh, by Giancomo Gastaldi, uh, a map of New Spain from 1548. And um, what I'm drawn to in this map is how you know, you have Mexico City, which is the biggest urban icon. You have these three towers and these two little structures connecting it. But if we look at this landscape, you see um, all of the, the places that would be called pueblos uh, by the Spanish were also designated by the very same generic icon. And there's a whole tradition in European map making of designating urban places with kind of generic signs. Um, they often have towers, sometimes they have battlements, sometimes they're kind of three-dimensional images of a city. One of the things I'm interested in the way is in the ways map makers just transpose this European symbol for cities to the Uh, were, were civilized pagans. They were not nomads, they were not barbarians, they were not cannibals. They lived in cities, they had wealth, they had civil order. And so every time I think John Locke looked at one of these maps, uh, every time any European looked at these maps of New Spain uh, and the Hispanized Americas, uh, they saw these images of cities and they associated them with what they knew cities to be. Uh, and the very same uh, icons on Spanish maps of the New World were the same icons that map makers used uh, in the Old World. Um, and I could show you a million of these maps, but that would take up all of our time. I'll just show you a couple more. So this is one of the important uh, images for my purposes because it's a manuscript image. It's created by the official um, Spanish cosmographer uh, for the Casa de Contratación de las Indias in Seville really the repository for official Spanish knowledge of the new world. And you'll see there's another urban icon that stands for all these places. It's kind of like the overlapping edges of a building seen from the ground level. And it's just repeated again and again. Sometimes this map is called the DeSoto map because maybe 14 of its 60 uh, towns are derived from the DeSoto Entrada, but it really wasn't composed by DeSoto. It's just drawing on his Entrada and synthesizing uh, these images of the new world. But it's important for John Locke in Carolina because uh, suddenly this iconography of native cities is not just confined to the Valley of Mexico or the mountains of Peru, it's expanding into North America. So uh, John Locke and others who are looking at maps like this uh, are expecting to find evidence of the same kind of societies that the Spanish have found elsewhere in Florida. Um, for those of you interested in map history, Abraham Ortelius is, is a key figure in the way this Spanish knowledge gets circulated to a broader audience. He publishes the often regarded as the first great uh, world atlas called the Theatrum Orbis Terrarum in Antwerp in 1570. Um, his map of the New World became a, really a default view of the Americas, and it contains many of these urban icons that spread from South America into the Valley of Mexico and into Florida. And uh, one of the updated maps that was added to a new edition of the Ortelius Atlas zooms in on specific places and shows more of these cities spreading everywhere. For our purposes, we just need to look at the Florida map, which tracks a lot of the DeSoto discoveries. And here we have the first published reference to uh, Cofita Chequi, which is uh, written as Catala Chegue. Um, but you can see that when John Locke and other English colonizers looked at maps like this, when they saw those urban icons, I think they were simple generic symbols that had a lot of meaning and association. Was reading. So we know that John Locke did more than just um, read. Uh, maps and texts that other people had written. He also was involved in producing texts and maps that described Carolina 
um, uh, uh, that went out to publicize the new colony. So um, uh, John Ogilby is the author of a book called America being the latest and most accurate description of the new world. This was a translation of a Dutch text that summarized a lot of these new world uh, um, sources. Uh, and it was published in England in 1671, just as the Carolina colonists were arriving on the banks of the Ashley River in North America. This book was important um, and John Ogilby wanted to update it with all the new information that was coming out of Carolina. The first edition of his book did not have uh, any information about Carolina. Uh, so John Ogilby actually communicated with John Locke and the other Lord's proprietors in London. He asked them for maps. He asked them for uh, information about Carolina so that when he republished this book in 1673, uh, it would have a whole section on Carolina and he could persuade more people to buy it because it would have all this new information of the new colony. What it did have in every edition was an extreme focus on the Spanish New World, all the same texts and chronicles. You can see from the title page that one of the main topics here is the uh, conquest of the vast empires of Mexico and Peru and the native cities, fortresses, towns, and temples that they discovered. So the kinds of um, places that Locke is expecting to find in Carolina are very much what John Ogilby is interested in, in as well. And when we look at the title illustration of John Ogilby's uh, book, you can see that all the tropes we've just talked about are, are on display. You have a, a native figure in beautiful feathered headdress, scattering golden objects, uh, exotic flora and fauna. This is an image of kind of um, uh, chiefly society. Um, uh, again, this is not the image of savage cannibals. It's the image of civilized pagans uh, in the Spanish mode. Um, so when John Locke, um, uh, writes a text that is published in, um, in John Ogilby's new edition of his book. He also provides uh, sketches and information that help make uh, what's regarded as the first official map of South Carolina. And I'd like to spend uh, the rest of my time today just walking you through this map and then circling back to the second treatise to talk about how John Locke put some of his ideas about uh, Carolina into action. So, um, I've annotated a version of this map because I want to draw your attention to uh, the way it integrates three discrete bodies of geographic knowledge. Uh, the red box uh, is one of the areas that the English knew firsthand. This is a, the, the Carolina coast. The red dot in the middle of this box is Charleston, South Carolina. So this is a place they could provide information about because they had explored it, they had seen it, but it's a very small part of South Carolina. It, they know virtually nothing about the interior. So to create images for this new map of Carolina, um, John Locke uh, finds other sources to send to John Ogilby and his engraver, James Moxon, as they prepare this map. Uh, the first, um, um, so here's a, a close-up of the area of English Carolina that was generated by uh, direct knowledge of the coast. Um, the, uh, this um, image here of all of these little native towns, um, and here you see St. Augustine represented by a red dot here. This, uh, this body of knowledge is coming from the old maps, uh, some of which I've already shown you. Uh, some of the places that I have highlighted here, I've done a little research on, and we can trace these uh, small chiefdoms that by the time John Locke produced his map were now uh, mission communities associated with the Spanish at St. Augustine. Many of these places are places that De Soto visited on his entradas, and they have a deep history in the maps and texts of Spanish colonization. So one of the areas that John Locke can kind of cobble together through his research and learning is a, a map of uh, the chiefdoms around Spanish St. Augustine. Um, That just as Carolina colonists were arriving on the coast, John Laterer uh, made a voyage from Virginia into the backcountry areas of Virginia and South Carolina. And John Locke got his hands on uh, a sketch map and a narrative of John Laterer's, Laterer's voyage. And um, John Laterer um, had read the same books that, um, that Locke uh, cited as the key sources on Spanish America. And just like John Locke, John Laterer, when he went into this interior where the Spanish had never been, he expected to find chiefdoms. And 
Um, I have some details drawn from his narrative about uh, why he calls these chiefdoms. Definitely, we have chiefly authority. There are signs of silver, pearls, and even gold and copper, mineral wealth. Um, we have the trapping, big temples, um, civilized government, all the things that were part of the trope of Indian chiefdoms that the Spanish had found. Uh, John Laterer found them as well. So uh, the take home from this map, which is usually just disregarded as the worst map ever made of South Carolina, nothing about it is really accurate. You can't, you can't properly geo-reference it on a modern base map, right? Um, but what's interesting about it isn't that it's accurate or inaccurate, is that it reflects the discontinuous kinds of knowledge that are woven together here by John Locke for publication, as he's trying to figure out what kind of a place um, uh, Kofita Cheki is. So uh, John Locke actually, uh, the manuscript map that John Locke drew based on this voyage exists. And I'll show you just a few details of this map. It's a little hard to read, but if we zoom in on it, you see this uh, dashed line down the middle. This line is the 31st parallel north, um, which is the southern boundary of the Charter of South Carolina granted by Charles II. And what John Locke is doing in this map, I think, is he's dividing this world, right? This world of North America, and the Circum-Caribbean uh, around the Gulf of Mexico into a Hispanized South and an Anglicized North. So everything south of the line is clearly marked as Spanish territory. You have the island of Cuba, you have Yucatan, you have the Valley of Mexico, um, but everything above this da dashed line, you see the toponym Carolina written out across it, um, is what Locke wants to claim for the new colony of Carolina. And you see the area of Port Royal, the River Ashley where Charleston is settled. Everything else is a big blank. This map is really designed to bring in these new potential chiefdoms that John Laterer has discovered, because these are gonna be the places that English Carolinians reach out to, to try to enact a, a version of the Spanish conquest, to try to create military allies against the Spanish in St. Augustine. So what, we've, what I've discovered in, in piecing all this together is not only that John Locke was a, a, an avid ethnographer who was interested in reading every source, every map he could get his hands on to try to figure out what Carolina was like, but he was actually creating ethnography as well. He was producing texts and maps that were trying to stitch all these disparate kinds of information uh, together. So uh, the end of this story, um, and I could say a lot more about it, but I think um, my time is running a little bit short. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up with some key ideas and invite your comments and questions. So um, this is an image that I put together um, of the real Southeastern world that John Locke was encountering that he couldn't really see clearly because his mind was clouded and directed by all the ethnography he had done based on sources that were complex and hard to interpret. Um, but we see Charleston uh, in its little uh, bubble of, uh, of, of, of colonial settlement. You can see up in the upper left corner, Jamestown and the much larger swath cut by Virginia across this land. But most of the Southeast, and this is not an exhaustive list of the Indian nations that occupied it, was, um, was a series of, um, uh, of native peoples who no longer uh, were part of chiefdom society. Many of them had, had ancestors who were part of chiefly society. These were mobile uh, coalescent societies that had uh, reformed after the onslaught of European infectious diseases and especially European commerce. One of the things that destroyed chiefly society in the Southeast was the fact that um, young men with a rifle from Virginia could capture slaves and hunt deer and take direct part in exchange with uh, English traders. Um, and that undercut the power of the chiefs to extract tribute and to redistribute that tribute. So um, this is the reality that John Locke faced. And he was very slow to realize uh, that this was the world he actually lived in, not a world of uh, venerable chiefdoms, but a world that was on the move with a lot of coalescent societies that were in the process of reformation. Um, so um, South Carolina did make contact with uh, a person they called the emperor of Kofita Cheki. Uh, that person uh, forged an alliance with South Carolina in the early 1670s a visit to Charleston. It was reported that he brought 100 warriors with him. 
So um, uh, by the time that South Carolina was at war with one of the Indian groups, the Westos in the interior, they sent an emissary to Kofita Chekwe to make good on this alliance and hoped that Kofita Chekwe would send some of those warriors south to help them fight the Westos. They never got a reply. In fact, there's no other reference to, to the existence of Kofita Chekwe in any other English record. So the kind of illusion of Kofita Chekwe um, uh, dissolved for South Carolina in 1680. And they had to face a new Indian world that they weren't fully prepared for. So uh, just to conclude, and there's more I could say about this, but I want to, uh, to wrap up now. Um, if we look at the second treatise of government um, with this experience in mind, what we see is a description of Indian life uh, as one of, of poverty, it, as one of um, uh, a lack of government, a lack of civil order. In fact, um, one of the things that Locke writes in the second treatise that is one of the key ideas that I think anchors the whole thing is the idea that an English laborer uh, uh, on poverty wages lives better than the richest king of the Indians in America. Uh, because um, these Native Americans uh, that Locke is now appreciating are not members of, of chiefdoms, but are, are, um, are, uh, are, are members of coalescent societies, don't seem wealthy or powerful or organized to him. They seem like a society in complete disarray that um, is really a subsistence-based society that um, is living in a, a world of natural abundance and making very little use out of it. So the key idea that John Locke comes up with uh, for the second treat is the idea of a state of nature and that Native Americans are a good contemporary example of that state of nature, I think derives directly from this engagement with the sources and the people of, of the Southeast. He expected to find these powerful noble chiefdoms that could give the Carolina colony a kind of distinctive purpose in the Atlantic world, a new kind of colony that would be uh, really um, enacting a form of Spanish colonization and all of the wealth and power that came with it. What he discovered was that the Indian world uh, of the reality was, was quite different. And it was, a, it was a world that he didn't respect and that, that he thought Native Americans um, uh, who belonged to it uh, didn't have the capacity for civil government. And um, there's more to be said about that, but I think I'll wrap it up there and welcome your questions and comments and anything you'd like to say about this. Thanks very much. Thanks.